Well, this is a car I've wanted to drive for a long time. This is a 1932 Marmon 16 cylinder. This is one of those mystery cars to me that always eluded me. I never drove one before. There was the Cadillac 16, I'd driven those, and of course the Duesenberg and the Packard 12. But this one always had a certain allure because this was their Hail Mary. You know, the company was going broke, they weren't doing well. And they saw the publicity the Cadillac got with their new 16. So they came out with the 16, which I actually think actually came out first, didn't exactly. it? Exactly. In fact, yeah. Marmon was working on their 16, but because of their financial situation, they didn't get theirs to market before Cadillac got That's theirs to market. That's what it was. And it was. that really, that was incredibly costly for them um, in terms of their business and in terms of publicity. They could have really made a big splash. Of course, one of the other great ironies and one of the things that I absolutely love is the entire idea of the cylinder wars. Here, the Depression had just started and all the American manufacturers were trying to see who could build the best, biggest engine car for the luxury market. Well, see, 1932 is my favorite year. 1932 and 1966. 1932, because by 1932, the automobile was here to stay. It was mm -hmm. a success. No longer a toy. No longer a toy. And it was reliable. It was dependable. Now it was about speed and prestige. You know, Henry Ford just wanted to make it reliable and get people moving. Okay, that's done. But once they're moving, boy, they wanted to look good moving, you know? Exactly. So you started coming out with all these impressive, the Packard Twin Six, the Cadillac 16. And this is a classic example of this. I think one reason it failed is because it's quiet. It, it wasn't flashy enough, you know? Uh, this is a very conservative car. If I were a banker or a Wall Street guy and I was very conservative, this would be old money, you know? That, that, well, has, that had 16 cylinders. It looks like a giant 32 Ford. Oh, and that's one of the great fascinations with the Marmon Mark. Um, Howard Carpenter Marmon, in fact, was a Presbyterian. And Presbyterians were known as not being showy people. Right. So he actually built a super luxury car for someone who didn't want to show off. Right. It seems slightly oxymoronic, but nonetheless, yeah. you know, uh, well, someone no, who wanted a car I, quality but didn't want to. to, to, to I talk get about that it. because when I worked at I worked at Foreign Motors in Boston, we were Rolls Royce, Mercedes, uh, Peugeot. We sold foreign cars, and one day we got a red Rolls convertible in. <laughs> it sat on the showroom floor for almost a full year. People would come in and go, oh, oh New England, yeah, a little flashy. And uh, we shipped it to California. It sold in two weeks right away that's eventually what we did we traded it off to and this was just like when you look at the dashboard it's handsome but it's not beautiful it's it, functional it's, it's, the, functional. it's the best thing that can be said it about it doesn't knock you out you know it's really functional and of course again thinking about technology technology has been a theme of ours in these uh, programs and the marmon mark almost forgotten today was one of the most important marks in american automotive history yeah. of course it came from the the, the first motor city of America, Indianapolis. Right. And um, they they started production in 1902 and pioneered in 1903, 1904, a V4 engine, right. V6, V8. And of course, a Marmon won the very first Indianapolis 500 exactly. in 1911. Exactly. And yet by 1933, they were gone. Yeah, yeah. It was hard to compete with the new General Motors and a few of these other companies. And like you said, it just wasn't flashy enough. If I was spending this kind of money, and this was big money, oh, this yeah. would be the equivalent of spending two or three hundred thousand dollars on a car. Now I think more, years. actually. Yeah, that's probably yeah. true. <laughs> and it just wasn't. I mean, look at it. It's a two-seater. Well, you got a rumble seat. That's okay. But it's just, it just wasn't. And you know, every time I looked at one, I go, "Boy, that's handsome," but it's not. Knock me. Out. You know, it's not right. beautiful doesn't uh, and it's, it's ironic that uh, of course their lack of sales success and the cost of the car uh, at the beginning of the depression make this particular model especially the coupe extremely rare there are only six of them built yeah and so it's an extraordinary experience to be in a Marmon 16 and to be in a Marmon 16 coupe is even a more extraordinary experience. Right. Did they make a convertible two-seater? They did not make a convertible two-seater. Well, Again, think, that would be far too flashy. I think that was another <laughs> problem. Yeah. yeah. You're it absolutely was, right. They should. They could have sold one. But can you imagine what, what Marmon would have said had somebody in Hollywood bought one of his cars? Well, that's what I mean. Plus, <laughs> your, your 
grill is not sufficiently impressive. Right. It's nice. It's a grill. It's a functional grill. Mm -hmm. It's very nice. The slats are not even chrome, you know, or or nickel. Uh, yeah. in, in, in so many ways, it actually seems like the larger, slightly more showy cousin of your Mennonite Model T. Yeah, it's, it's like funny. How, how how quiet can you make yeah. a luxury car? I mean, I like it. And I, I would have bought one now, but at the time, when it came down to a Marmonoid Duesenberg, I always went with the Duesenberg because that had the power, that had the prestige, that had the racing success. I mean, this is a wonderful car, but it's a scary motor because when you drive one now, like this one, which is nicely finished, <coughs> you think, oh, this is great. But when you see one and the heads are cracked, and there's water coming out of the bottom of it, and you don't know, is that block crack? Oh boy, aluminum is gonna warp, and aluminum gets gets corroded easily. Oh my God, it, 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 everyone I looked at was just too scary. And that's one of those places where a car like this is a much, much more viable proposition as a collector item today than it was even 20 or 30 years ago right. because the very small but very active Marmon community really supports these cars and although there are very few of them they have had reproduction uh, heads cast replacement heads cast uh, they're working on water pumps right now as sure. a project as a group so it's the kind of thing that they appreciate how important these cars are and the necessity to keep them running right. which I think is fantastic because these are cars that should be experienced on the road but everyone I looked at was a quarter million dollar project. <laughs> I mean, you go, oh boy, well, I, I mean, aluminum, am I gonna be able to fix this? Is it, is the block warped? It's been sitting outside for 50 years, you know. It was always scary, but that being said, it is a handsome car. Absolutely. It, it's, it's quiet, elegance, it, it, it's very understated. The dashboard, as we said, is functional. It, it looks like, uh, when you bought, you know, the EB110, well, God, mm -hmm. had a dashboard just like this, a slab of wood with six holes in it and six gauges. And, you know, when you look at All the Bugatti with the big tack or, you know, right. you know, dashboards, you look at it every day. It's like marrying a woman with a pretty face. You're going to be staring at it every day over the breakfast table. And it's more pleasant if it's attractive. And to me, when I get in my Packard where, you know, each little gradient is marked on the it, it's just fun to, to look at. It's fun to watch. And and that's not to say, uh, to compare it to some of the great uh, coach-built Italian cars or the German cars yeah. with mother of pearl and, and all sorts of right. things like you'd find in the Mercedes uh, of this period. That would be uh, an even more miraculous thing and something that the 16 uh, certainly and the Italians deserved. still do it very good. You know, when I look at a, uh, a Pagani Zonda, you look at yes. that, that dashboard and most people just silk screen a dashboard and it looks perfectly well. Whereas Pagani has a jeweler. He has a jeweler actually make each one. And they're like crazy amounts of money. But it's got to be perfect, you know. And in terms of the character of this car, you know, as we have visited these houses in Newport, each one of them having a particularly different character, I think that the house we're going to visit next has a character that really suits this car in that it may not be what you expect from a great mansion of Newport. Right. You know, it's funny when you're in Hollywood, they go, oh, that's Cary Grant's house. That was Betty Davis' house. That was Jimmy Stewart's house. When you come to Newport, oh, that was the Campbell Soup home. That was the uh, Liggett Tobacco residence. That, you know, it's all, it's all captains of industry and commerce. Exactly. Nothing as vulgar as Hollywood. <laughs> Absolutely not entertainment that's the family at home with the piano right but i must say the steering box is excellent it doesn't feel like power steering but it's certainly easy to turn considering well geared and that massive engine up front it's well geared it drives very very nicely all kinds of torque you can slow right down to five or six miles an hour in third and without any snatch it pulls mm -hmm. away it is also interesting um, as was the case with the uh, duesenberg brothers when you had companies, of course, every company back in the uh, the beginning of the 20th century had to prove themselves through competition because right. that was the thing, whether they were a company that was built on competition or not. But it's very funny to think of us wafting along in this Marmon 16 as Marmon being the first winner of the Indianapolis 500. It doesn't seem 
to match with a car like this. Right, exactly. So Jay, as we stated that the Marmon 16 was the luxury car for the person who didn't want to be ostentatious, when people think of many Newport mansions, they think of marble and acres of columns. But this place, Hope Dean, is not like that at all. The house was designed in 1889 by the Boston firm of Peabody and Stearns for Ms. Elizabeth Hope Gamel Slater. Now, what's really interesting about this is the fact that it was not designed for her and her husband, it was designed for her. She actually had this house designed and built and moved into it alone. So that was something very, very unusual for the time, but she was also a woman of very particular tastes, and you can see that this is a Georgian house, not at all either the, uh, the timber uh, frame beach house that was typical here or the great marble gilded mansions. This is a solid, sensible English house here in Newport. And that also has an effect on the siting of this house. The original property here was on 92 acres and included homes for all of the members of the Gamel family. So the house across the road, the house next door, and the houses down the block were all part of an extended family. And they did not pick a location that's on the actual open ocean front. We're here in Easton's Bay and with a view of the ocean in the distance. And the location of this house is also quite interesting because it contrasts with the other Newport houses that are on the open Atlantic Ocean side of town. This is on Easton's Bay, opening out to the ocean, so it's a much quieter area here. And in fact, the beginning of the famous Newport Cliff Walk is right below this house. Oh. And it goes all the way back around to end at Seaweed, another of the houses that we've seen in our segments. Robert Hale Ives, a merchant with the firm Brown and Ives, began assembling this property in the 1850s. Later, it was divided among his heirs, including Elizabeth Hope Gamble Slater, his granddaughter. Hope Dean was one of Peabody and Stern's largest and most monumental houses, and the last they would build in Newport. The house has no primary facade, and it seems clear that the architects intended the building to be viewed and experienced from all sides. The interior design of the principal rooms was done by Ogden Codman Jr., who did the breakers and who collaborated with Edith Wharton in the Decoration of Houses, the first book on interior design published in 1897. Cliff Avenue, which parallels the ocean, was a private road maintained by its residents, mostly members of the Ives family. Even today, Hope Dean is one of the most elusive of the Newport mansions simply because of its location, suiting Slater perfectly as she craved privacy from the press above all else. This pioneering woman formed a company with her siblings to develop the remaining acreage assembled by their grandfather. Slater summered at Hope Dean until her death in 1944, when it was sold to Count Reventlow, who owned it until 1958. The current owners have extensively restored the property and grounds, bringing it back to its original grandeur and decoration. While furnished with museum-quality antiques and fine art, Hope Dean is simply the family home to the current owners and their large family, as evidenced by the elaborate playset in the grounds for the grandchildren. Dean comes from the Old English for Valley, so Hope Dean stands for Hope's Valley, the hope so eloquently realized by this remarkable woman. Now, I was under the impression that uh, Lance, how do, you, how do you say it? Revent Love. Revent Love. Lance Revent Love, a famous racer, he, with the Scarab, that was his car, as I remember. Uh, very wealthy, sort of playboy, race car driver kind of guy, handsome, had everything going for him. Did he live here? Absolutely, and of course, what could be more Newport and more Willie K. Vanderbilt than Lance Reventloff? Right. Yes, his father, Count Kurt von Augelitz Reventloff, bought this house, and Lance lived here for a little while while he was a teenager. Oh, okay, all right. So again, the entire connection of Newport and racing comes home once again. Right. Let's move on to uh, another car. This is probably the smallest engine capacity of the three, right? Was it one and a half liter? One and a half liter. Yeah. Another member of the class of 1932. So we have here a 1934 Aston Martin one and a half liter. And it's quite interesting that Lionel Martin, who started the, what would become the Aston Martin Company, uh, was somebody who was very, very independent, again, like uh, Elizabeth uh, Gamel, 
um, he saw his way forward to, to doing things a certain way and he went into business with his friend Anthony Bamford and started up the uh, Bamford and Martin Company, which, which uh, manufactured Aston Martins after the famous Aston Hill climb, right, where right. they had had great success. And it's a very interesting thing because a car like this, Aston Martin today is known, of course, for Goldfinger and uh, the DB5 and the DB6 and, and the cars like that. But this is really what made Aston Martin's reputation. Lightweight, very um, uh, tossable cars. They were very successful in competition in period. Uh, in 1932, in fact, they won their class at Le Mans uh, with the Aston Martin Ulster model. And cars like this were frequently driven by young English gentlemen who wanted to race them on the weekend and use them during the week as, as passenger cars. And they built their own engine, which was admirable. To me, that's the mark of a, a real company is when they build their own power plant. Because a lot of companies and, and reputable companies, you'd buy a, a Meadows engine or an America Continental or mm -hmm. a Beaver or one of those and just drop it in and go racing. Whereas they actually took the time to develop not just the handling, but the whole car. And you look at the size of the massive brakes on this as well. Uh, you, massive brakes in the front and back, which was just starting to become prevalent at that point. They meant business with this car. And again, um, as, as we've often discussed, the fact that the go factor was much bigger than the, the stop factor. And as with the, uh, the initial engines in cars where you thought, oh, if I want to make the car go faster, I'll just make a bigger engine. Right. If I want to make the car stop better, I'll just put it on a larger brake. Now, these brakes don't have that much stopping capacity relative to their size today. Well, they but, are hydraulic, which is yeah. interesting because in 34, especially in England, there was still a lot of cable operated brakes around. And think of Bugatti. Uh, Bugatti this as time. well. Bugatti did not change over. Ford didn't change over until after 34. So to me, that showed the mark. They were really progressive. They built their own engine, did their own suspension, big brakes, and hydraulics as well. And as I said before, I really like a car that communicates with you. When you drive this car, you are aware of everything that's going on. Every bump in the road, every little um, gradation of, of, of elevation, of, of markings in the road. So it's alive, it really communicates with you. And you can sort of tell, it's sort of like a, 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 a great running dog, you know? And this, I think, was a car, if I remember correctly, was stored by Harris back in the 60s, I think it was. It was, this is a very old restoration. And of course, um, Bill Harris really uh, created the modern restoration techniques that we all take for granted today. The idea that you would actually do research into how the car was built, look at how it was built before you took it apart. Once you took it apart, you identified every piece, labeled it, put it neatly on a shelf, and then did your work, component by component. And it's really a tribute to that restoration, the fact that this car appears so incredibly well today. Very nice. Well, we have another Aston Martin over here. We this do. Is one of my, this is a car I have wanted to drive forever. It just seems to have eluded me. The DB4, which is the purest example, I think, of the DBs. DB5 was the Goldfinger car. I, 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 that one's nice too. DB6, too much like a Bentley Continental, a little bigger, more comfortable. There is, this is it in its purest form, and it's just beautiful. Let's take a look at this car, because it's a very special kind of DB4. Today we've got a 1963 Aston Martin DB4 Vantage. Now, of course, you mentioned the fact that the DB4 is the purest form. Uh, again, uh, you know my predilection for the Italian things. And this is designed by Turing Superleggera. And it has such a wonderful Italian form, yet is quintessentially English. Yeah, it's got that classic English dashboard, English steering wheel. You know, there's just something about these. You know, I used to call them Jags that went to finishing school, which is kind of what, because the Jag was also a six cylinder, approximately the same horsepower, give or take, but these were twice as expensive. Why? Well, I guess when you drive one, you find out, and I'm gonna find out in just a few minutes, but I remember uh, we all think of Sean Connery and the Goldfinger with the DB5. In fact, I had Sean Connery on the show once, and I asked if they gave him one. He goes, no, they didn't give me one, no, you know. Uh, but he was ever the Scotsman. I said, do you ever buy an Aston DB5? No, I bought a Jensen, second hand G. I got a good deal on it. I got a Jensen CV8. Never had an Aston Martin. Oh, it just made me laugh. Just made me laugh. Scotsman to the end. Hilarious. Absolutely. And the fact that you are half Scots has half nothing Scotch, to... Half Scotch, half Italian. So exactly. This, well, this to me has the best of both worlds. There you are. 
And of course, this is a very special DB4 because this is a DB4 Vantage. Now, the sharp-eyed viewer may, may note that the, most of the standard DB4s have upright open headlights. This has the covered headlights that we saw on the DB5. Right. But the Vantage, the high-performance versions of the DB4 also feature these. And the hood scoop, which is seen on the DB4 GT, the very high-performance racing model. So this is sort of the adaptation of the racing model for the road. And I think most people would be surprised to learn this is a four-seater car. Not exactly. really. You have the seat in the back. You have to be pretty tiny to fit back there. But it is. And this is not a sports car. This was a grand touring car that had pretensions to be a sports car. I mean, you could drive it for hours on end up through the Alps or whatever and be comfortable and have power and handling like a sports car, but really more a grand touring car. Wouldn't you agree? I would agree completely. And Aston was very, very, very smart. And there's then ownership uh, by David Brown, who was a brilliant marketer and who really placed these cars quite well. The DB4 GT that they raced and raced quite successfully only looked like the car. It has a much shorter wheelbase, much lighter weight. Right. So therefore, it, could, it was a purpose-built competition car, but it looked very much like the one that you could buy for the road. I remember the, a guy bought a, a DB4 and he was a friend of David Brown. He said, I want it for your cost. I want it for what it costs you to make it. And David Brown charged him a thousand dollars more because he lost a thousand dollars in every one he <laughs> every one he built. He said, "All right, I'll give it to you for my price." And this is what. So he just lost money in every one. The story of Aston Martin is the story of so many specialist car builders because from the time that Lionel Martin started the company through the David Brown era and afterwards through Victor Gauntlet, any number of owners till the present time today, Astons have always been very romantic ideas. But as a going bus business concern, yeah. it's been tough. But it's a straight six, twin cam, two valve. And uh, w uh, does it have Webers or is it? Uh, this has Webers. Has Weber Absolutely. It has Weber carburetors, uh, triple Weber carburetors. And this example has also been bored out from the original 3.7 liters to four liters. Well, let's take it for a ride. I'm anxious to see Absolutely. what Absolutely. Let's go. about uh, a car like this DB4 is the fact that it is a GT car so it's got enough comfort and compliance in right. suspension in the seats to make you feel like you know you're not being abused by the car and yet you can also still feel how tight it is. Well that's what I always tell people with Aston Martin you know you think you want a sports car you think you want the Porsche Cura GT with the Vaccaro seats and all the other stuff a bit too harsh for the for the daily drive you know this it's relaxing and it's I don't know it's got so much history I like Aston Martin as a company I like the fact that I like the leather I like the sound system I like the steering wheel I like the the interiors the way they're set up as a proper GT car but have sporting pretensions so to speak exactly. even though they really are as modern sports cars yeah exactly and one of the things that also uh, makes a difference is there are lots of companies that want to have sporting reputations right you know um, but when a company has actually performed in competition it makes a difference in their product sure and you can also tell when a company stops performing in competition and when they begin to sort of rest on their laurels you know a lot of people don't realize Carol Shelby first won for Aston Martin at Le Mans correct? exactly you know, this thing is Carroll Shelby is the old American guy, and he certainly is. But he did race for Aston Martin, and he won for them. And it's uh, also it's uh, a real hark back to a different day in racing, when the teams were really like families, a very close knit. They right. would often, uh, as we've often discussed, drive the cars down to the races. So you know, they prepare the the cars at the factory in England, and then get into them and drive to France to go to Reims or drive to Germany right. to go to the Nürburgring or to Belgium to go to Spa and uh, that must have been an amazing experience yeah. as well. And Kyle Schaub only stopped racing because he had heart problems and then he only had heart problems because he got the bill from Aston Martin he went what? What? <laughs> How much is <laughs> And then his heart gave out that's what happened. Well you know we, we, we often talk uh, as, as people know about values. And we're not talking about values today, but it is a very interesting thing too about this particular car because it was born as a right-hand drive example. Right. And uh, it's been converted to left-hand drive, and yet it did not have 
a deleterious effect on value. Right. It's a very interesting thing with Aston Martins because these are cars that people buy to drive. And so there's no extra premium for having a right-hand drive example, and there's no penalty for converting it to left-hand drive. Right, but I once met a man in, I believe he was from Saudi Arabia, who had 264 DB5s. Oh, uh, that's a bit was, excessive. And he was trying to buy them all. I think that's one of the reasons why the prices are so crazy. Because I can remember, I looked at one of these for $18,000, but the chassis was so rotted out. Uh. And the guy said, well, I'm going to put it in auction. I go, and I, you know, I was honestly, and this is 25 years ago, maybe longer. I honestly thought, look, I'm paying you more than it's worth 18. I'm not trying to, you know, uh, screw you over here. That's about what it's worth. Cool. And it wound up going for $186,000. And I felt bad because I thought maybe the guy, but I, I didn't see how it was worth that much. It required so much. And that's another very interesting thing about values. Yes, there is that uh, very well-known uh, Middle Eastern collector that has uh, bought a great number of Aston Martins. The other thing that, however, the other thing that, that also affects value is the fact that the English love to support their own. Right. And you see this, whether it be English actors, English sports stars, it's the homegrown team is the one that counts and they root for. Right. So they look on Aston Martin, even though it's got a wonderful an Aston Martin like this, a wonderful inline double overhead cam six engine as the English Ferrari. It's more the English Maserati in truth, but because of the, the esteem with which the English hold these cars, they value them personally like the Italians and the rest of the world would value a Ferrari. You know, Maserati is good because I have a 1963 Maserati 3500. The exact competitor for this car. The ex it, it is this car. It's an eight plug, six cylinder, twin cam, two valve. I mean, it's almost, it's the Italian version of this car. Transmission, everything is exactly. Precisely. And yet, I paid $45,000 for that car. Now, your Maserati would be worth considerably more now than right. you paid for it. Yeah. But no, the values compared to an Aston. Not even close. Not even close. Not close at all. But again, I think that that's part of the, the glory of collector cars is the fact that we can find the cars that suit our personality and our needs and, and buy them because the Aston Martin is an Aston Martin. You know, you wouldn't say, I really want a Maserati, so I'll buy an Aston Martin instead right. or vice versa. Right. To have both is the ideal situation. But I love this. This feels much stronger than a standard car. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is a hot rod. And you know, every time you hit the throttle you, in your head, you hear that. Dan it, dan it, dan Let's check the uh, the radar to I'm, see yeah, where I mean, uh, where Aura yeah. Goldfinger is right uh, now. I contend that so much of that value is the bond factor, isn't it? It is. Although one of the questions which I've always wondered, and I know that this has been on your mind too, Jay, is when Sean Connery is driving that DB. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. When he's driving that Aston Martin on that Alpine Pass and he's being chased by the Mustang. Right. Why can't he get away from a 1964 Mustang convertible in his Aston Martin? Well, and Dr. No, he's in a Sunbeam Alpine. He's being chased by, a I hearse. believe, like seven Koreans and a 190D diesel Mercedes. Oh, no, that's in, that's in, that's in Goldfinger. They're, they're, in, they're oh, in Ponton oh. diesels. And he's oh, yeah, also, yeah, yeah. he can't yeah, get away yeah. from them either. Yeah, he's got he's to squirt him with water and smoke. And, exactly. Yeah. Dr. No, he's driving the Alpine, and he's being chased by Jamaicans in a hearse. That's right. And it's like, you know, yeah, somehow I, it's... It's very it's... funny. <laughs> a little pushy. <laughs> but it is, a, uh, it is a remarkable thing. You know, I love Sean Connery. He's one of my favorite guests. And when he heard I was Scottish, or half Scottish, oh, he loved that. Oh, you're Scottish, yeah. That's fantastic. But I think it's so funny, he didn't buy an Aston, he bought a Jensen CV8 second hand. Practically an Aston? Yeah. Not. But you're a Jensen owner. I know, I love my CV8. And again, it's about horses for courses. It's not that a Jensen is an Aston, but an Aston also isn't a Jensen. Right. And again, talking about the character of these cars and this car in this town. I mean, this is a car you can just imagine the Lancer event lows of, of Newport driving. This you know? is a car you want to buy from a specialist who knows Aston, who has all the books, all the history, 
because it's so easy to doctor one of these up, you know? Absolutely, and this, this car is a spectacular example. Came from one of those specialists that exactly is who you're talking about. And you have a confidence in, in a car like this, you know? Right, exactly. Well, this is a really excellent example. Of all the cars we drove, I, this is the one I would pick, I think. I mean, it's a perfect example with a, just a little more horsepower than was stock, which is good. It wasn't, you know, it doesn't overrun itself, you know what I mean? Brakes are good, transmission is flawless, shifts wonderfully. It's a five speed when that was considered so exotic. Exactly. Know? Most American cars, you bought a Mustang, you can't stand it with a three speed. You could order a four speed. This had a five speed. Oh my God. It just seemed like it. It just seemed like the most exotic car in the world. And driving it, I see why people felt that way. So it's a very interesting thing to see in the three cars we looked at and Hope Dean itself. The fact that you can have sophistication without flash in a thoroughly Newport fashion. Independent thought. There you go. Why, thank you. Oh, we're, oh, we're not talking about me. We're talking about the car. There you go. Well, Donald, thank you very much. Thanks for this opportunity to drive this fabulous car. It's really terrific. My pleasure, Jay. All right. Let's do some more of these. We will. Easton's Bay and with a view of the ocean in the distance. So it's a much quieter part of the Newport scene. And in fact, the yeah, famous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a much quieter part of the Newport area. Much quieter. Exactly. Yeah. No construction going on here. 